wanted to give you guys a brief introduction to Human Rights Watch and the Young Professionals Network. Human Rights Watch is one of the world's leading human rights organizations, and they're really effective with their three-part approach, which is to investigate human rights abuses, um, and they also like <laughs> investigate human rights abuses, and they expose those abuses widely, and they pressure those in power to actually protect human rights and to bring about change. And one of the reasons that they're so effective in what they do is because their approach is at a policy level. And in doing that, they're able to actually, you know, influence countries and the different policies that um, are in effect there. And another thing that human rights is known for doing is really focusing on the issues that are going to move the needle. Now, the Human Rights Watch Young Professionals Network is a group that we started about a year ago, me and my co-chair, Caitlin. And our goal in creating this group was to just bring about more awareness of human rights and human rights issues to the young professional community here in the Bay Area. And in doing that, we have a variety of events, educational and fundraising. We have happy hours, we have um, a cocktail party, and we have events like this one, uh, panel discussions and more intimate discussions with human rights activists. We're really happy to be a part of tonight's event and wanted to thank CJA for inviting us to be a part of it. And we're also really thrilled to have Nicholas here with, uh, with us today. Nicholas was actually recognized by Human Rights Watch not too long ago for his courageous efforts in protecting human rights. And we're really excited to hear from him tonight and to learn more about the important work that he does. Thank you. Thank you. My name's uh, Jacob Foster. I'm a co-chair of the Young Professionals Committee at CJA. And CJA, the reason why I'm involved with this organization is that they're doing really unique work to help bring to justice human rights abusers, genocide heirs, criminals from all over the world. And they do so in an incredible multidisciplinary way using policy, litigation, advocacy, partnerships with other organizations. Um, and our committee reflects that. We hold speaker series four times a year. There's lawyers involved, uh, policy advocates, members of the technology community. And so we hope that all of you will come to events uh, like this more in the future when we can connect people to the type of work that CJA has been doing. Um, one case, one recent notable success that I just would like to mention is in the Jesuit massacre case. And I think this really crystallizes the type of work that CJA does and the benefit that it can bring to the fight for justice around the world. Um, in the Jesuit mas massacre, uh, six Jesuit priests, their housekeeper, her daughter, were assassinated by the governments of El Salvador near the end of the Civil War. And they were assassinated because they were fighting for peace. They were trying to bring an end to the Civil War, um, and the government opposed that. Unfortunately, without CJA's work, there has not been accountability, not for years, not for decades, there's not accountability in El Salvador because there's a blanket amnesty law, which means that the perpetrators of those crimes uh, cannot be prosecuted there. And our own country is complicit in this. One of the perpetrators of the massacre, a high-ranking general, immigrated to the United States. He was here. He was working in a candy factory, in fact, outside of Boston taking advantage of all the liberties that we have in this country, popping gummy bears, <laughs> doing, you know, doing whatever he was doing. And without CJA, he would have gone on living this banal American life. Um, but CJA <laughs> brought him to justice. They brought a proceeding in Spain, a criminal case under principles of universal jurisdiction against the leadership in the military, the president of El Salvador at the time, and they brought a case in the United States. An arrest warrant was issued in Spain, and recently this colonel, the gummy bear maker, 
was ordered extradited to Spain to face justice for these crimes. And so that's one example of why uh, we on the committee work so hard to spread the message about the type of work that CJ is doing and have events like uh, the one tonight. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening and panelists. Uh, Blaine Bookie is uh, an incredible lawyer, activist, uh, center, uh, a professor at Hastings. She's been on the front lines fighting for, fighting against uh, gender and crimes of sexual violence in Haiti, and more broadly is an expert on these is issues and LGBTI rights around the world. Um, so I'd like to bring Blaine up, and if we could give her a round of applause for agreeing to moderate this program tonight. Thank you. Way too nice of an introduction for, for what's his worth. Uh, the real uh, hero among us tonight is Nicholas Atillo, and we're so, I really had the distinct honor of introducing him and then getting to pepper him with some questions and then opening it up to the rest of you to really have this opportunity. And um, raise your hand if you've seen the movie God Loves Uganda. Okay, it's on Netflix. Everyone needs to watch this movie and see what's happening there and the U.S.'s role in the discrimination and violence against LGBT people in that country. So you have your homework for later tonight. Um, but uh, Nicholas is the director and co founding director of an organization called Chapter 4 Uganda, which is named after the Bill of Rights um, in the Ugandan Constitution, which I think is just really just a wonderful name and I think really speaks to the breadth of the organization and really just the founding principles. Um, so for his young age, which is my age, um, which is very young. Uh, <laughs> he has, I, I mean, it's just very, very incredible to, um, to, to just see and read about what he's accomplished in, you know, in, in his years and how highly he's regarded among uh, his colleagues in Uganda and this kind of idea that you see that's talked about on their website about this idea of sort of improving um, and professionalizing human rights work in Uganda. And that is really sort of the front lines for where we're going to see you know, real change. Um, and he, you know, he's been work doing this work at grave risk to his own um, safety um, and the safety of his staff. Um, and he's, he's no stranger to hardship, having grown up in northern Uganda, really at the height of the, of the conflict there, um, and you know, would go far distances in order to escape being abducted by the Lord's Resistance Army at, at night when he was sleeping. Um, he had to witness abuse of his family members. Um, at university, he really channeled this into working, uh, focusing on human rights, and then attended law school. Um, he, after finishing law school, uh, worked as an interpreter with the International Criminal, Co Criminal Court's investigation into war crimes that were committed during the war. After that, he became an investigator with an organization that was monitoring police abuse, and that wasn't enough, so he started you know, sort of taking cases on the side, helping individuals challenge their detention and, get and helping people obtain their liberty. And um, in 2013, he founded Chapter 4 Uganda, uh, which he describes as being modeled on the ACLU. And I, I think that I could see that as a model, but I think that you're – the work that you're doing is so inspirational and, and has taken on a life of its own. Um, and he's worked on several high-profile cases, which I think he'll talk about some of them tonight, but in particular challenging a successful challenge to the anti-homosexuality uh, bill um, in, in Uganda, which uh, if it had been allowed to stand would have punished gays with life imprisonment. Um, and as a result of uh, his activities, he's received um, verbal threats and, and death. Um, death threats. And as uh, we already heard from our colleague at Human Rights Watch, he's been honored many times over, um, and he was, invite he was an invitee to the U.S. Africa Summit last year. Um, he was a uh, visiting scholar at Stanford Center for African Studies, um, and then he's also been teaching a course at UCSF on global health. So his accolades are many, and that's only scratching the surface, so I'd like to invite Nicholas so we can hear some more from him. So. Um, you, oh, you have a microphone. Yeah, okay, yeah. great. So I, I guess I'll just start by asking you to sort of, you know, you've been doing a lot of these talks, um, and maybe just tell us sort of what I missed about your story, um, and then sort of what you think are the most pressing issues um, that, that you're working on now, and sort of what you'd like to share with this audience. 
Um, good evening, and uh, thank you very much for a wonderful introduction. I have never been in a room full of love. You know. um, when I'm back in Uganda, I wake up every morning to people bombarding me with insults, uh, with uh, people calling me all kinds of names. So this is a new environment for me. So guys, thank you very much. Um, um, I wish I could hug each one of you individually, <laughs> but uh, no, that's, that's not possible. So let me just say thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I just came off a talk this afternoon at UCSF where I was sharing with the faculty and the students about uh, our work in Uganda. Our work in Uganda is a very humble contribution to the broader human rights work at, you know, in Uganda. We are simply just lawyers who have chosen to dedicate ourselves not to big corporate interests, but to defending the rights of those on the margins of our society. This work is informed by my background, really. Um, growing up in a very uh, cruel, uh, deprived uh, you know, environment in northern Uganda, uh, seeing my family suffer uh, the brunt of uh, rebel abuse, uh, seeing my sister being enslaved in sex uh, slavery in the LRA for eight years. Um, I grew up very bitter. I was an extremely bitter child and uh, thought of how I could remove myself and help others in a similar situation. So at first I wanted to be a journalist. I don't know how many of you here are journalists. Um, but I wanted to be a journalist. So I tried to write in the newspapers. Uh, but it occurred to me that writing about it wouldn't necessarily help much. So I eventually found my way to law school and channeled my anger into an effort to try and uh, provide legal services to the underprivileged in our society. Now, as many lawyers will confess, lawyers are very pompous people. They, <laughs> <laughs> they like to work for big corporations. Uh, they like to cut big checks and drive posh cars. Um, I would have easily gone and done that uh, because I thought I was a fairly decent lawyer anyway. <laughs> but uh, I felt that that was not my calling. And so for the last 10 years, I have been involved in human rights work. And uh, that's what we do in Uganda. Chapter 4 is dedicated to providing legal services to the underprivileged. One of our most pressing uh, uh, work is our work with sexual minorities. This work began way back in 2008 when a group of sexual minorities uh, who were just having a good time in a bar outside Kampala were arrested for simply being homosexual. So when that happened, no lawyer was willing to come out to go and defend uh, the people who had been arrested. I found myself going to attend to them in police cells. I found myself going to court to defend them because I believed very strongly in my heart that there was no place for discrimination based on sexual uh, orientation or gender identity. And <coughs> two years later, when a law was introduced in the Ugandan parliament. There was no lawyer willing to speak against the law. I was the only lawyer who went on TV, went on radio, and spoke against the law. And many people dismissed us as being foreign agents, uh, as being um, extremists uh, in our thoughts. Um, but we eventually uh, scaled up the campaign against the law, and eventually that led to a court challenge uh, that um, overturned Uganda's anti-gay law in 2014. So that's what we do in Uganda. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just that small number. Yeah, it is. Do you, um, can you talk uh, just a little bit more about the constitutional challenge and um, sort of how, how that came to be? And also I've seen written, you know, some about the backlash that's occurred as a result um, and just a little bit about sort of where things are now. Well, in 2009, private member's bill was introduced in the Ugandan parliament that sought to provide for, among other things, the death penalty for having a different sexual orientation or gender identity. Now, that law was not a new law in Uganda because same-sex conduct had been uh, unlawful since 1950 when 
the British introduced uh, a law in Uganda they call an offense of having sex against the order of nature. I have no idea what having sex against the order of nature <laughs> is. And the law never defined what was sex against the order of nature. But it had been a law in our law books for over 60 years. The strange thing about that law was that the law was never implemented. It was an idle legislation. Nobody was prosecuted up until the end of last year under that 1950s law. So the attempt in 2009 was an attempt to recriminalize what was already unlawful anyway. The difference between the 1950 legislation and the, 19, uh, sorry, and the 2009 legislation is that it provided for a death penalty. That was the proposal. It provided for offenses such as promotion of homosexuality, undefined but broadly termed as promotion of homosexuality. It also provided for offenses such as providing accommodation or renting a house to a, a gay person, anybody who provided a house would potentially be committing a crime. Um, but the most outstanding difference with that law is that that law was largely and sadly so inspired by American evangelical groups and American conservative politicians. And here is how they did it. And I've got to take you back to the history of our country to just explain that better so you can understand. In 1979, Idi Amin, that most Americans know, was overthrown in Uganda. When Idi Amin was overthrown, the subsequent governments were extremely weak and fractured and unable to provide basic social services to people in the countryside. There was a void in the country. That void was filled by religious groups of all kinds, Catholics, Protestants, American evangelical groups. They built schools, they built churches, they built universities across the country and were providing really good services. Uh, as a result, they built social capital. They became very powerful in the country and became um, a very huge voting bloc. Now, they began to use that social capital to influence state policies. And their first attempt was at the HIV AIDS uh, uh, law. Uganda was known for a very successful fight against HIV AIDS which was premised on uh, advocacy for condom use uh, as a first line of, uh, of, uh, of defense. Uh, well, if I say first line of defense, it sounds like it's false. <laughs> uh, but as, as a, first, a first measure to, to avoid infection, um, when religious groups began to have a strong foothold on the state, that was completely gutted uh, and replaced with a policy of abstinence, and being faithful. Of course, those are very difficult things for any human being to, to hold on to. And the result of which was a spike in HIV AIDS infection. When they were done with HIV AIDS, they then moved on to the question of sexual minorities. An issue that was never publicly discussed in Uganda, an issue that was not even of concern to anybody, became the mainstay of their campaign. And in 2009, an American evangelical pastor called Pastor Scott Lively went to Uganda and began to hold several meetings with parliamentarians. He held parliament for two days, lecturing members of parliament. And in his lectures, he simply said three things. First, that there is such a thing as a gay agenda, that the gay people want to take over the world and that Uganda is ground zero, it's their starting point, and that <laughs> you know, Ugandans must fight back. The second thing that he said is that the gay people are recruiting children into homosexuality, they're training children to become homosexual. They're enticing them with money, with jobs, with scholarships, and turning them into homosexuals. And that people must rise up to defend their children uh, from being recruited. And then the third thing that he said was that the gay people were responsible for the killings of Jews in Nazi Germany. And that the same thing would happen in Uganda if they didn't stand up to 
the same uh, value. So you have parliament, you have school children for days preaching this kind of gospel. And the result of which was um, a draft of a law that was then introduced in 2001. Now, as I said, the law went through a couple of debates, and in 2013, the law was passed. When that law was passed, three weeks later, we filed a case in court and challenged the law. The law was declared null and void. Now, here is the good and the bad thing about the court decision. The good thing about the court decision is that several individuals who were under investigation, who had been arrested under the law, received temporary reprieve because their cases were dropped. Uh, you know, they were released. The I mean, the investigations were, were, were stopped. So, so it was temporary relief for them. They were happy about it. But that is only as far as the good thing goes because the bad thing about that decision is the court took the easier route. The court did not address the substantive question of whether sexual minorities have equal rights as anybody else under our constitution, leaving an open window for a possible reintroduction of the law in parliament. So the court chose the easier way and annulled the law on a basis of technicality, simply arguing that when the law was being passed, the MPs didn't have the numbers to pass the law, that there was no quorum in parliament to pass the law. So the court missed a huge opportunity to once and for all put this matter to rest and make a decision that every Ugandan is entitled to equal protection under the law. Fast forward, what then happened was there was an attempt to reintroduce the law in fact in parliament. Uh, a new bill was drafted. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, the law was never introduced uh, up until now. But Strangely from a lawyer, the problem in Uganda is not the law. The problem in Uganda is people's attitude towards sexual minorities. Attitudes premised on misinformation, attitudes premised on a misinterpretation of the Bible and the teachings of Jesus, attitudes premised on what I think is a false, a false description of what they say is African culture, because I don't believe that there's such a thing as a, an African culture, given the diversities in the continent, given the diversities even within ethnic groups uh, uh, you know, in Uganda, or in fact in any country in, you know, on, on the continent. These attitudes are so entrenched, so much so that uh, a, you know, a recent survey done by a, a group called Afrobarometer at the end of last year indicated that 92% of people in Uganda believe that uh, LGBTI people should not enjoy the same rights as any other Ugandan. That LGBTI people are people who are working against the culture and religious values of, of peoples in Uganda. So the problem is people's attitudes. Now, if I said, attitude to the people sounds abstract. Let me just explain this to you in a more vivid way in a story. And here's the story, and this is a true story, of a good client of ours who, his name is Albert. This is his real name. Albert was a designer. He made clothes. He was called a designer because he walked like a model on the cartridge. Right? He was a nice guy. You know, he ran a beauty, you know, shop, a boutique, you know, big shopping arcade uh, in the outskirts of Kampala in a town called Entebbe. Albert was living with his partner called Bernard Randall, the British Marshal. One evening, their house was robbed. When their house was robbed, Bernard went to the authorities and reported robbery. He was appalled that his house was broken into. Investigations were commenced. Suspects were arrested. The suspects were charged in court and remanded to prison on a charge of theft and robbery. But lo and behold, when uh, the stolen items were recovered, he went through the laptops and through his phones and discovered that he was gay. And all the robbery charges were dropped. The robbery suspects were freed from prison. 
and turned into state witnesses against Bernard and Albert for their hostility. When Albert was arrested, he was taken to a medical doctor. According to him, he was subjected to forced NA exams in the presence of over 15 people, all the while being told he's a sodomite, all the while being told he's an agent of Western powers. When that was done, uh, they inserted their fingers into his anus to check if he was gay. They held a press conference in which Albert's pictures were taken by the press. Number plates of his car were made public. As a result, Albert was evicted from his shop. Albert couldn't stay in his neighborhood. Uh, he had to move, move away to a different neighborhood. He couldn't drive his car in public because each time he drove his car, he would be stoned. Albert had to report to court after every two weeks. Now, if he wasn't reporting to court, he was attending to extortions from people who claimed they had information about him and who claimed they could help him. And um, eventually Albert uh, was arraigned in court. Uh, we discovered that if he went for trial, he would lose because of the public attitude uh, you know, against Albert because his case was widely covered in the press. So we simply went into a process of pointing out uh, the flaws in his case to the Director of Public Prosecution. And luckily for us, the case against Albert was dropped. But Albert's story is the common story for every LGBTI person in Uganda. They may not be bludgered on the street and killed. That is uh, a, ra you know, a very rare case. It hasn't happened in a very long time. But every single day, they face subtle, persistent discrimination from all parts of our society, from the family to the taxi driver on the street to uh, the lady in the restaurant serving your food who looks at you and says, you don't belong here. And for me, that is what is breaking people's hearts in Uganda, together with the public onslaught and the public discrimination against uh, some pe uh, people in Uganda. You're making my job very easy. <laughs> that's a, that's a good Let me try and make it difficult. <laughs> um, but so, so how do you change those attitudes? Um, like you were saying how you, know, you thought that the, the, the court kind of took the easy way out by not making that discrimination, uh, do you, that you know, LGBT people are entitled to the same rights under the Constitution. Do you think that that sort of ruling from the high court would have an impact on the ground? Um, you know, there's a lot of debate here whether Roe versus Wade was too early and there wasn't enough in a coalition around abortion rights, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you see that playing out in Uganda um, in terms of, you know, the importance of the legal case um, and then just the other work that you at Chapter 4 in Uganda are doing and sort of what you see as a solution? As I said, the court's decision was important at an individual level for people who are facing prosecution. And for those individuals, that decision was God sent. They were happy about it, and many of them uh, you know, felt uh, it was a happy time to rejoice. But court decisions do not change people's attitudes. Um, first of all, people don't read court decisions anyway. Uh, the vast majority are illiterate um, and, and have no access to court, court reporting and, and don't read court decisions. What influences people's attitudes is actions taken by public officials in public office and actions taken by people who are opinion leaders in society. So what we are doing in Uganda to change attitudes is, is, is a couple things. First, we realize that this is going to be a long process. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, we are investing our efforts in deliberate discussions to ensure that we respond to the basis, you know, the useless basis of people like Scott Lively. Uh, so we are doing so first by locating LGBTI rights within the broader human rights campaign. Because I think the perception is that when you say LGBTI rights, you're introducing a new set of rights. In fact, we are not. We are asking for human rights, but human rights of LGBTI people. So getting the LGBTI group and movement in Uganda to be involved in the broader human rights debate, to be as concerned about violations of women's rights, 
to be as concerned about violations of the rights of children. And that process is, is a process ongoing. And, and, and if, if you go to the website, uh, put up pages of those groups in Uganda, you see them actively involved. The second thing that we are doing is trying to get their families to sit down. Because when people realize that these are people who have families, who have feelings, who you can associate with and say, oh, I know a gay person, I know a lesbian woman, I know a transgender, then people's attitudes will change. The third thing that we are doing is harnessing the power of social media. Many Ugandans now have smartphones and communicate via social media. Um, so we're using those platforms to project those messages and make sure people understand that uh, gay people are not aliens. They're ordinary Ugandans who have been in our society for as long as our society has been. So and on the flip side, on the US side, we obviously have some work to do here in terms of changing attitudes and, and sort of the culpability of Scott Lively and, and his role um, and his organization's role in violence in the country. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about the lawsuit um, yeah. and in the US and, and what you hope um, the sort of trajectory of the case will be and, and how you think it might be received um, in the country given the sort of long history of US intervention um, in the perceived intervention in culture in the country? Well, Pastor Scott Lively was sued in a court, in a federal court in Boston under the Allen Tort Statute. Uh, it's a US legislation. The suit was filed in 2012, um, essentially sought to hold him to account for his role in a conspiracy to deprive uh, gay people of their rights in Uganda. When the suit was filed, the suit was met with various applications for dismissals, for discontinuance, for stay of prosecution, but thankfully all of those um, applications were dismissed. For the first time in US legal history, the court held that persecuting people against, I mean, persecuting people on the basis of their sexual orientation constituted a crime against humanity under the PS, AST. That, that is itself significant. Uh, now, the case has been in court since 2012, and, and I thought that the US legal system was faster. <laughs> um, but since 2012, we haven't got into a hearing stage. My role in that case has been very simple, to help the US-based lawyers uh, provide data and research materials from Uganda to enable them uh, to make a good case uh, before the US court. Now, Pastor Scott Lively's case is important for us because first, it, it has sent a very strong message to American evangelical groups and their allies in the US that somebody is watching over them that they would go around the world, do what they were doing, but they would be held to account. So that is important. It has held them back. We have seen a significant drop in their level of involvement in Uganda. Many of them who are very strong allies of Scott Lively and their friends in Uganda have publicly tried to distance themselves uh, from Pastor Scott Lively and from their allies in Uganda. But back home in Uganda, that case is important because one of the leading pastors who led the campaign against gay people in Uganda is Pastor Martin Semper. If you watch the documentary, God Loves Uganda, he was the guy showing gay porn in a church. Uh, what a better place to show, <laughs> uh, you know. But he was, he was that guy. So when the case was filed, we discovered that he was an American registered voter of Ugandan, of course, of Ugandan origin. So the lawyers in uh, New York filed that he should be subpoenaed. That's a US term. I think we say summoned. Uh, they issued an order to summon him to come and appear in court for deposition in April of last year. As soon as the order was issued, he has disappeared. He's nowhere to be found. He has abandoned his church. He has abandoned his radio and TV programs that he held every week. He's run away. He's hiding. 
and 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 significantly his work has been has been disrupted so it's a good thing that he's being sued and and i would suggest to those of you who are here that uh he has only been summoned to a court to be a witness i wish you could sue him as well in the u.s because he's an american citizen because i think that will send a very strong message to many of the people uh, in uganda who are allies of people like uh, scott lively because as I've come to understand, people like Scott Lively are seen as clowns here in the U.S., right? <coughs> people watching him in Uganda. San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> people watching him, I mean, people worship that guy in Uganda. They look to him as the messenger, okay? So I think it is time for well-meaning American evangelical groups and individuals to come to Uganda come to the African continent and undo the things that your own brothers and sisters are doing in the continent. How do, how do you do that in a respectful way? Um, you know, what's your advice to Americans or you know, non-Africans for, for actually doing that kind of work in a way that's you know, solidar solidar and building and you know, mm. respectful? First, I think long term. Long term, I think that Americans must learn to harness the power of their cultural influence. American culture is still preeminent, and, and make no mistake about it. People in Uganda would worship American culture. People, young people would want to, to speak like they're from, uh, not Arkansas, Arkansas has a bad accent. <laughs> 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 They want to speak like folks from Los Angeles or the Bay Area. Uh, they worship American superstars and musicians and sports people. I think it is time to begin to harness the power of America as such power to begin to change that discussion in Uganda. It will have to be subtle. It doesn't have to be all over your face like rashes. So be very subtle about it. Deliberate and long term. That's that's the first advice. The second advice that I would give to Americans is that do not go with I know it will happen. Because you actually don't know the lived experience of a gay Ugandan man. I think that you've got to listen to them, you've got to uh, to to amplify their voices, uh, you've got to make sure that uh, they find within themselves the solution for their problem. Your work is to help them walk through that process. I think that is important. But also more importantly is American politicians. The American government has been extremely helpful in pushing back the anti-gay uh, movement in Uganda. There was an article in the New York Times, I think it was one of the most um, uh, ridiculous articles actually, in December of last year, suggesting that American interventions in Uganda has been unhelpful. To the contrary, that is, that is not true. It's been very helpful. But I think that they can still do more. Appointing a special envoy on the rights of sexual minorities, appointing a special coordinator in the office of USID is an excellent initiative. But that has to translate into actual activities on the ground that recipient of American aid, organizations, individuals in Uganda must be those who subscribe to the same values that uh, American people do. And I think for me, you can do that. But more importantly, focus on your people uh, on the hill. Some of the folks who have been there, do you, do you guys vote people out? <laughs> Some of the guys who have been there for far too long <laughs> and have developed relationships with African dictators, like the Ugandan president has been in power since 1986. Since I was five years, they are close friends and they influence a lot of things uh, you know, around the world. Focus on your capitals and influence your government, your MPs, your legislators to begin to hold the values you espouse as a country. Because I think that some of them are, are doing more harm than good. I think I'll open it up now for any questions from the audience. Oh wow, <laughs> we are at a, t at a startup. <laughs> oh. 
That's that's fancy. Ooh, yikes. So you you've said that you think that finding uh, LGBTQ rights in Uganda is a long term process, and obviously there's still a lot of roadblocks to that. But are there ele any elements in Uganda, whether it's culture or the legal system, that might give Ugandans more of a fast track to that than we've seen in the United States? Is there any advantage to the LGBTQ community there that we might not have seen here in the U.S.? Well, unfortunately not. Unfortunately, it's going to be the long road for us. Uh, first, because of the, the stark odds against 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 the transfer campaign. So it's, there's no shortcut to it. I think we must keep all options open and engage full throttle. Whether it is litigation, those who are litigating must litigate. Uh, those who are doing advocacy must do advocacy. But in terms of messaging, I think three things are important. Uh, and this is important for Americans to understand. The first is military relations. The U.S. has some of one of the strongest military relations with Uganda in the fight against terror. When State Department issues a statement condemning Ugandans for passing the anti-gay law, the U.S. Army commanders stand up with medals to decorate Ugandan generals. That undermines significantly the good human rights message from State Department. So I think that, first of all, you must begin to harness the power of your relationship in the fight against terror to begin to make the point that long-term American interest and indeed Ugandan interest is better served with a more democratic state, with a state that respects human rights. That's a given. The second one is economics. The people who run our country know the economic impact of passing the law that they pass. Uh, the people in the Ministry of Finance understand that there was a sudden dip in tourism income because people just didn't want to turn up in Uganda. So they lost money. The World Bank withdrew $19 million, which was meant for Uganda's health sector. So let's speak the economic language. You will understand. They know what it means. The third one is that I think we need to focus on the broader human rights issue. I mean, broader human rights discourse as well. Because you might win the war for LGBTI rights, but they still have to operate within an environment where there is a repressive regime, where there is an autocratic leader who is increasingly becoming intolerant and who just won his sixth term in office about a week ago. So you need to focus on the broader human rights discourse and make sure that there is a safe environment for everybody to be able to do what they want to do. Okay. Oh, great. Oh, here we go. That's a bit scary. I'm going to hold my wine and talk at the same time. Um, thank you so much for being here, both of you, for this um, really an incredible talk. And I really just want to throw a quick plug to God Loves Uganda. For those of you who have not seen the documentary, it's a really incredible film that really goes into depth about um, the American evangelical uh, responsibility for a lot of anti-homosexuality work and legislation in Uganda itself. Um, I'm curious about our win last year in the Supreme Court that now that um, in June 2015 that um, LGBT I, uh, rights have been affirmed in the United States and that marriage equality was finally passed. I'm curious if that had an effect on your work and on in terms of exporting American cultural opinions to Uganda. In uh, my legal work, I look at cases from across the world, the bad ones and the good ones. Uh, the bad case that I had read before coming to the U.S. was the Indian decision that uh, essentially reversed uh, an earlier court decision uh, that uh, had affirmed the equality of all before the Indian law. I was reading that case and listening to the, uh, the oral submissions of lawyers in court, uh, and I was glad to hear that the case has been recommitted uh, for, for fresh hearing. The U.S. decision was extremely useful, at least speaking for myself as a lawyer, in shaping my responses and my arguments 
uh, in the case of the rights that are set to gain in the future. So we've benefited from that decision immensely in terms of uh, both the argument of the late Justice uh, Scalia uh, and indeed the majority decision of the rest of the court uh, uh, written by you know, Chief Justice Roberts. So we, f we, we have benefited from it. I have downloaded from the U.S. Supreme Court website the audio uh, and, 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 and the written argument before the court. And, and I think that, is that, that that is useful. But I do think that that also provides for us um, um, a realization that litigation alone is not the solution. Because in the US, as you will admit, um, you still have people like the Kentucky Club who would refuse to celebrate you know, um, a wedding, or the guy who wouldn't sell you cake. You know, so we know that there are limitations to what the law can do, as seen by the American experience, or indeed as seen by the South African experience. Because in South Africa, South Africa led the way before the US and um, provided for equality for everybody under their law, including certain minorities. But there has been a lot of crime still committed against uh, gay people in South Africa. You know, there's gang rape, there's corrective rape, there's the attacks on transgender people. So I think that while the case is important for, for those of us who are lawyers, uh, it also provides uh, just a rude awakening that the law and litigation has its own limitations. Thank you. I, I read the article on Africa online, the U.S. support of gay rights photographer may have done more harm than good. That's you not my article. You mentioned that briefly, but could you just mention, can you go into more depth? Because I read the article and I was very concerned that we're doing harm when that's not our intention. But I think you said that that wasn't true. Absolutely right. Can you explain more about this? Because the article was very clear about the harm that we're doing. Well, if you read that article, that article took the view of a university student in Nigeria one single individual in Nigeria and attempted to project that as the views of the people on the continent. Now, I don't speak for Nigeria, but I can speak for Uganda, having worked with the U.S. government and the U.S. embassy in Kampala, having worked with the U.S. ambassador then, Ambassador Scott, uh, Scott Belushi, and having worked with American officials at USID at CDC, I know that their intervention was critical in pushing back, and, and this is why I mean, I mean, this is why I say it was critical. First, the reaction of the American government was to withdraw funding from the religious groups that were involved in propagating the anti-gay debate in Uganda. Funding was withdrawn from them and reallocated to groups that were affirming, that were inclusive. That significantly disabled the Inter-Religious Council of Uganda, which was the main body that was uh, advancing uh, the anti-gay debate. Secondly, they issued targeted sanctions at individuals who were involved in the campaign. Now, they didn't mention their names publicly, but people who were involved felt the pinch and had a complete reversal of, of, of their attitudes. The Ugandan president came to the U.S. and couldn't find a hotel to stay because hotel owners just said you couldn't give a room to a person who is uh, assaulting gay people. He went to an EU meeting in Brussels and couldn't go to the meeting room because some of the EU folks there were uh, hell-bent on embarrassing him. So U.S. intervention for the case of Uganda has been useful. But that is not to say that there were no missteps. Along the way, there were missteps, and we have got to admit that there were missteps. And one of those missteps, for example, was an early attempt to use quiet diplomacy. The U.S. ambassador believed that the president would have signed the law because the president had given him a private undertaking. But as we now know, he lied. 
had the U.S. seen that ahead of time because the president had phoned President of Museveni lying in private and doing completely a different you know, thing in public. That was a misstep. And I think that uh, <coughs> they, they learned their lessons from that. But on the whole, on the bigger picture, the intervention of the U.S. government in the case of Uganda was extremely useful. Yeah. So, so disregard that article, at least in as far as Uganda is concerned. summers ago, I had the chance to do um, a feature story on a human rights organization called PASA, People Against Suffering, Oppression, and Poverty, in Cape Town in South Africa. And I was able to see firsthand um, a lot of human rights work, and I saw that they really needed a lot of help. So I was wondering if it's in your plans um, to connect with other human rights organizations and sort of help them to accomplish the same things or how you plan to do that? We are working with different organizations <coughs> in Uganda and in East Africa, um, doing just more than litigation uh, because LGBT organizations cannot register legally in Uganda, right? Because they won't allow them to register. But 15 years ago, one of the organizations registered it's called Spectrum Uganda, the oldest uh, LGBT organization in Uganda. But when we did a legal audit uh, of Spectrum, we discovered that they were in complete breach of every law we knew on the, you know, in the land. They hadn't filed tax returns. They hadn't filed uh, required returns to the company registry. So we worked with them to plug those loopholes, make sure that they were in compliance with reporting requirements. So beyond litigation, we're also working to empower organizations such as that to be able to, to grow. And when I travel and speak around, around, around the US and around the world, I do ask people to support those organizations. Uh, if you don't like me and you can't support me, that's fine. <laughs> uh, you can support, for example, Spectrum Minorities in Uganda, which is a non-registered but powerful coalition of LGBT organizations who need uh, skills in uh, fundraising skills, who need management training. Many of them actually need advocacy skills um, or even just understanding the LGBTI uh, landscape in terms of what are the arguments you can, you can provide to respond. So we're doing a whole lot of that. Uh, in some cases, acting as conduits for resources for some of them because uh, they just can't open a bank account. Uh, so if people need to support them, uh, they can uh, give that support through us and we can give it to them. So that, that's what we're doing, working with other organizations in the country. But outside of the country, we're also building networks and coalitions. First, for people to understand the problem because I have discovered not many people understand them. I've never felt so far away the end of the world, uh, you know. Uh, so making people understand what is happening in Uganda, but interesting them as well to work with us and other groups in Uganda to fight back. Uh, I've already agreed to talk to Leah Price about the possibility of, of um, having a suit against uh, people in the US. I have spoken to other organizations about, about the same. Uh, so we hope that going forward, these uh, dialogues will provide for us a good critical mass of people that are willing to support the work in Uganda, but broadly on the African continent. So before our last question, um, can you just tell us where people can donate to Chapter 4 Uganda? Our physical sponsor in the U.S. is the Global Fund for Human Rights, based in Ibiti. Uh, they are the ones who, for the purposes of tax reporting for U.S. Uh, groups, you can give your contributions to them. They will pass on that contribution to us. Uh, I can email the details of the Global the Fund for Human Rights. Yes. Um, so last question, um, in the back there, you've had your hand up for a while, so. And then I, I think there's still a little bit of time afterwards for people to, to come and. 
grabbing a book, but we'll, we'll close with your question, so thank you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I wanted to ask you, besides your work with LGBTIQ individuals, which is so important and incredible to hear about, um, what you and your organization are doing to bring healing and justice to the people of northern Uganda? I come from northern Uganda, so it's very dear to me. It's, it's extremely dear to me. Um, but, but let me say this. Because I believe very strongly in equal treatment before the law, I have been involved in defending a rebel commander who was being tried in the courts in Uganda. Um, he is the guy who abducted my sister. But when he was captured himself and was being prosecuted within the criminal justice system, there was no lawyer in northern Uganda who could stand up for his rights. He asked me to do so. I thought that that was my contribution to ensuring equal treatment before the law, due process, irrespective of what it did to my family. <laughs> that case went to the Supreme Court. It's now gone back to the High Court. We're waiting for a hearing date. I will defend him as seriously as I defend anybody so that he can have due process. Northern Uganda is dear to me, and there are many other things that we are doing. I'll give you an example of one case that we are now doing in northern Uganda. There's a lot of land grabbing in northern Uganda because after the conflict, people who are rich and have state connections went and grabbed land from poor women. Now, these women were so helpless that in some cases they were left landless. They had no place to till the soil to grow food. So a group of them got together to demonstrate in the very unique and powerful way that only women can by stripping naked. <laughs> uh, it caused a lot of uproar, but those women who were arrested and were being prosecuted for being a public nuisance, we are defending them in court, and we think that uh, we, we have a good case.